Gracious God, loving Father, our hearts are indeed drawn to come to worship you this day in spirit and in truth, and to give thanks for God's Son, our redemption, forgiveness, and mercy, for healing and cleansing from all iniquity and to the righteousness that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you, you clothe us in garments of salvation and beautify us, that you heal us. You lift us from the mud and the mire, from the ditch where the world passed it by. Thank you that you stopped to listen to our heartbeat and to our cry. And from that fearful pit you lifted us up, Lord, and you set our feet on that path, the path of righteousness, the path of holiness, that will lead eventually to eternity with you. So we bless you, Lord, as we come before the throne of grace, such a welcoming spiritual reality that it's a grace that we receive from God. It's not severity and judgment and harshness, but it's mercy and goodness and love. And so Lord, we come as a needy people in the humanity and the frailty to ask for mercy to be poured out upon us, upon us all, all of our families, all of our, our communities. And that suddenly, Lord, our communities will be awakened to the reality of your love for the world. And that they would not walk past the church in the days to come, but be drawn by your spirit to hear the word that will save them and change them. We pray, Lord, that you would establish a, a sanctuary of your holiness and worship here that will pervade the parish. That people will be drawn to the gospel and to the love that is flowing from the throne of grace, even through us, your people. We bless you for each and every one here today, Lord. Thank you for the, the gift of life, for the, from the moment of conception through the whole journey of life, the wonder of it all. We prosper, we flourish, and then we fade away. But Lord, even in our fading years, we, we find a dignity and a peace and a blessedness, not a sadness that our days upon the earth are coming to an end, but a great thankfulness for what we have seen and experienced in our life, the love of family, children and grandparents travel so many wonderful things but most of all the salvation that we found and that found us for which we've come to the first this day we bless you lord that you preserve each one of us for, for the sunday service some from afar and calm we pray that their time here will truly be a refreshing time and a lifting time of love and rest and goodness Thank you for families and the bonds that we have. And if some of us don't see family from one end here to the other, we're still bound in a, in a precious way. Thank you for parents, for brothers, sisters, cousins, relatives, all that means so much to us, Father. So bless our families, the extended families we pray. Bless the children and the young folks as they go to Sunday school for the first time and may the teacher be inspired to, to teach them to draw wondrous things from their heart and to pour wonderful things into their heart in the days and months to come. So lead us in a worship and may be spiritually alive and vibrant and most of all relevant for our Christian faith. So may we hear a word in season and know that God is speaking to us. And may we be a people who will act upon the word that we hear today, that we won't go home and forget it and get on with life's other trivia. That something of your spirit and word will rest in the mind of each one of us and set you upon us. We offer you this time of worship with thanksgiving for the forgiveness of all our sins, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, a reading before we have our second singing, and the reading is taken from the Gospel of John. And reading from 23 to 31, Gospel of John, chapter 14. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own, they belong to the Father who sent them. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not
God give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of the world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father, and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us see. Amen. And Jesus did exactly as the Father said. And this is our next song. How deep the Father's love that he would send his Son. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only Son to make the wretch his treasure. Stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise 
of the Father. Now we've just read in John 14 what the promise of the Father was. That when I go, we will send the Advocate, the one who will stand alongside me, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And yet they didn't fully understand how it could be, how, what it meant. But Jesus, in, again in Acts 1, says, For John baptized, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised. For John baptized with water, then in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we know, if you know your history, and if you know the second chapter of Acts, then that's what happened. But we're not going to get to that. Because, so Ascension Day happened 40 days after, <clears throat> after the Passover. And then another 10 days beyond that was Pentecost. And we find in God's Word an order of days and months and of seasons. And we know that from the Jewish festivals, which really serve as a complete backdrop of the Christian faith. It's not that I have an overemphasis on the Jewish background, but they're essential for us to understand the interpretation and the application of the Christian message. If we cut off the old, we're left with a, a less than full message and understanding of the gospel of Christ, why he had to come, what he fulfilled. So it's good to have the background. We don't follow the seasons, the festivals, but Jesus did, the early church did, but very soon, maybe in the second century, when most of the leaders of the church became Gentile believers, or not Jews, they dispensed with this idea of referring to the, the biblical festivals of Passover and of the one that was coming, of Pentecost. And so we find, as you know in your calendar, that Easter changes year by year the date of it, and so does Pentecost. Pentecost changes uh, in the Christian calendar, but it doesn't change in the biblical Jewish calendar which they follow today. And I hope you're following with me so far. So after, after the Passover, the Jewish people were commanded again in Leviticus uh, to count the Omer. The Omer was a sheaf of fresh grain which they would normally take to the temple and offer to God as their thanksgiving for the harvest. And they were to take this sheaf and wave it before God for 50 days. 50 they, they knew that something was going to happen in 50 days. Normally it would be a celebration, the agricultural celebration of Pentecost. But this time, something new that had never happened in the history, the history of the world happened on this day. So Jesus says that he would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. This was the promise of the Father. And it's a completely new experience for them, and it is for many people in the church even today, the concept of Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I'd like just to present a picture of it, maybe one that disarms some of the fears and apprehensions that people have when we hear, when we hear terminologies like that. Now the disciples, each one of them, had received the Holy Spirit in John 20, it is recorded that they were in a room together, confused and certain, they just seen Jesus crucified, and all of a sudden Jesus entered the room, came through the wall, came whatever, and he stood in the midst and said, it is I, see my hands, see the wounds, and he assured them. And then it says, he breathed upon them and said, receive me the Holy Spirit. So according to our traditional understanding, that was the time when they were born again. We, we say born again. Uh, another way of putting it is born from above. It's the same phraseology, but it means born again. But the body, the, the birthing comes from heaven. That's what it means. It's not something that man can do. It's not something that man can generate. This new birth, it is a divine gift that comes from heaven. Each time, it, it was a divine gift on the day of Pentecost, and it's a divine gift when it happens to you and I. It comes down, it can't be passed on through the church, through the minister, through friends. It can only be received personally as we receive it from a Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. So God is the giver. But then he said, you must wait in Jerusalem. Wait, wait, wait. Wait upon God and pray. And when you're, he says, 
that the Spirit of God would come with, he would come with power and with purpose in verse 8. That's, that's what he promised. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And so what did he mean by that? We'll have a look at that. The section here was full of promise. God saying, I'm going to do a certain thing. And can we ask ourselves, do we have a sense of <coughs> expectation? Do we have at any time a, a personal sense of anticipating something that God is going to do? Do we have a, a sense that God is about to break forth among us? We shouldn't lose uh, our expectation uh, with Bible. But rather, we should build it up because God has a purpose for us. So that's the, the backdrop to the day today that we enter into. Now you'll probably be aware that next Sunday is, I think I'll ask you, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Be aware of that. Again, it's not something that many of us here celebrate or record or bear witness to, but it is a tradition throughout most of the Christian world. It is, it is a tradition. Um, and for the reason I explained just a few minutes ago, the, the Gentile leaders of the church changed the dates of the biblical festivals to fit down with other times. And although we and the church will recognize and celebrate Pentecost next Sunday, it's really not, it's really not next Sunday when it happens. It is actually today. It is actually today. To, tonight at sunset is the beginning of Pentecost, according to the biblical pattern. We can change it to next Sunday, next month, but biblically speaking, and you see that God kept to the order of the Old, of the Old Testament throughout the year. But Pentecost is a two-day festival. It begins tonight and concludes on Tuesday evening at sunset. So there's a sense in which Jews then, as they did, they prayed and they waited upon God. It was, a, it was a, a time of expectation, a time of wonder. Wonder what God was going to do. Wonder how God was going to fulfill the promise that I was sent from the Father. And it's good to have that sense of anticipation. So next, on Tuesday, as it says in the beginning of chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So there were two days of Pentecost. And so we are the first one today. So it's, maybe that's something new for us to consider. And it's, I'll leave it in one of the background. Sometimes all these statistics and background can confuse us. Easter, I'll, I'll, I'll just recite Pentecost is observed on the seventh Sunday after Easter and ten days after Ascension. But these are all man made uh, determinations and not biblical ones. Anyway. Let me now focus on the two aspects that were promised here when promise from the Father actually came. To come with power and with purpose. The Holy Spirit came. These are the benchmarks, I would say, of what it was good enough for the disciples and the early church. And it ought to be good enough for us in every generation too, that we would understand that God is still at work by his power with a purpose. And that Neither have changed. The power of God is still the same power of God. The purpose of God is still the same, as we will see from the text here. And he comes with, first of all, in power. The power to us is something sometimes we, we shrink back from. It can be a, a forceful thing, an aggressive thing. We think of power coming on. But the power of God can be totally different. And many people are apprehensive when speaking about it power of God being present. The disciples have no idea what was going to happen on that day, but we leave that maybe for another time. Because God wants to do beyond what we can think. If we were to, if God was to be limited to what we expect of him, how little would we see God? But if we raise our expectations to see what God wants for us, it brings us into another dimension because scripture says he will do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask of things. So even our big ideas and visions and hopes can be so little. They can just be puffed up vain thoughts and, and hopes. But when God comes, something wonderful, something that transcends 
our own experience takes place. And I can only speak for myself, and I pray that us too would be a people who would be willing to, uh, and I desire as people, as I was preaching us speak in Psalm 42, that we would hunger and thirst for God to quench us spiritually. Hunger and thirst for a reality to our Christian life and church and personally, in every way, that it would become dry and religious and just scheduled like something violent, that we be in a sense carrying along in normality until we have, when it says, a suddenly of God, a suddenly God entered the home. Suddenly God did this. And you know, you'll have, you'll have read the, the local history of revivals too. But that's what happened here. It was a time of dryness, a time of spiritual just emptiness, and people were aware of that. And so they began to wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. And he prayed in various houses in, in the community here. And in one of the houses, God came one day in his power. And a, a house, according to those who were there, literally shook. The power of God came and visited that house. And it's recorded in the book that that was the day, in a sense, from, from when the Great Awakening began in this island. I know a lot has been written and a lot of speculation, but these are the bare bones of the reality of what happened. And you drive past that house, and you, if you go down that, that way to Barnes, you drive past it and see that house. But that's, that's gone. And I, I remember speaking to a lad in Aberdeen who came from Sky, and during some period, I can't remember the, the time frame, but they too had that experience in a house, in a, in a house meeting at a time of, of awakening and stirring, and people were gathering to meet and to wait upon the Lord. They didn't know what they were waiting for specifically, but they were just praying. And then one night, as they were together, the exact same thing happened. There was a shaking in off the house, literally. I believe it could have been uh, in Kailaki, I'm not sure, but there was a, there was a time of uh, growth and salvation, and many people came to faith. When the Spirit came in power, He came in power. Now, we don't always expect the building to shake, especially as we've just refurbished it. We don't want the walls to crack and chandeliers to fall down, but we do desire a trust, a visitation of God. But God often comes. The Spirit of God comes. He's gracious. He's not overbearing. He's not forceful, coercive. He's gentle. Now, gentle sounds so light, but gentleness can be so, so profound and so strong. And when the gentleness of the Spirit comes upon us, even the hardest heart, even the hardest heart of anyone who's watching this who, who might not be a Christian, the hardest heart who thinks that a million miles away from God, when the Spirit of God touches them, their hearts are melted and they see their sin. But they don't see their sin to, to be condemned. They see, they look up and they say, Here is love that redeemed me from my sin. So the dual purpose of God and the Spirit is to, to bring a reality, a deeper reality of Christ to us. And I can guarantee that every one of us here will desire a greater reality of Jesus Christ in our lives. But Jesus is not here. Jesus is in heaven at the throne of the Father. But he has sent his Spirit to, to be him. As he said, I'm going and I'm coming back. He came back in the form of the Spirit. So if we were to, if Jesus was to come back to us, we would welcome him. We would just, we would go wild with excitement to see Jesus. Well, in a godly sense too, let us be excited to welcome the person of the Holy Spirit, of God the Holy Spirit, whom we confess and declare in our liturgies, that God the Father, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and when he has his rightful place in the church, he too will do wondrous things for us. And however we are like that today, I trust that our prayers to this congregation, to those watching, that God will bless us and do wondrous things for us, for his kingdom. That the house here will be full with people, and next door the overflow full. The people will be clamoring. And these are not high in the sky dreams that we the minister can go off into tangents, but it's something that's born out of biblical faith and wider historical reference, and to give you something to pray for, and to hope for, 
and to long for it. Again, as I said last week, these things don't happen without just longing. They don't come when we're passive or just thinking about it or hoping for the best. They come when we seek God, when we, when we wait upon Him like His disciples. So God comes to make Himself more real to us. And again, let me say that on our Thursday prayer meeting, that was the case. God came again in a way that heightened our awareness of Him. And this, to me, is a wonderful key to our future. When we sense that there's a greater nearness of the Lord, we know that God has come with purpose. And that's the second part of this. He comes in power to restore, to refresh your Christian life, to make us passionate, to draw backsliders back to Him. But He also comes with a purpose. And the purpose here was that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Because as, as we read here, we need the Holy Spirit, the one whom Jesus promised would come, that he would do marvelous things for us that no one or nothing else in this world can do. And nothing's changed. Humanity still has the same need, you and I, as God's people, and those who are watching who may not be God's people, that we need desperately the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. And I pray that as we unfold the scriptures today, um, we'll, have a, we'll have a feel for that. So today, first of all, a little recap from Thursday. I think it'll help to put uh, the text in setting and give a little bit of the, the biblical background to it. And uh, on Thursday, Thursday the 13th of May, it was a day that probably bypassed most of us, include myself and my year after year, it's not a date that's really recorded with any significance in the Western Church. But it is followed, maybe in the Anglican, I'm not sure, but certainly in the Eastern and Orthodox Churches, it is followed. And it's the day when, uh, it's called Ascension Day. Ascension Day, when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, to the Father, having completed the work that the Father had given him. He was saying to his disciples, it's time, soon to be time for me to go. Of course, he didn't say how he was going to go, and they were perplexed. They, were, they couldn't understand it, and of course, how could they? It had never happened before. But as he was discussing with them one day, we read this in the book of Acts, and as he was speaking with them, he was caught up into the heavens and disappeared from sight. And then the angels came to to reassure them that this same Jesus, whom you have seen enter heaven, will return in the same manner. And we spoke of this in Thursday a little how the biblical prophets, especially Zechariah, give us a glimpse of the future when it says there that one day his feet shall again rest upon the Mount of Olives, the literal physical Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And again, the mountain will, will split and a, a deep the ravine will be formed and the water will flow. So these are these are visions that, that the prophets had of days to come, which to us sound so far fetched. <coughs> to us, sometimes our Christian faith is so so cerebral, so it's all worked out in the natural mind with reason with and we have to have reason and logic. But there are things which absolutely transcend the logic and the, the normal patterns of thought. And such is this. How could anyone comprehend that suddenly the master was taken up to heaven. But he was. And he, he left with great purpose, having completed the work of redemption, but he also had a further purpose, which he was trying to explain to the disciples. He said, it is actually better for you that I go. Now, how could that possibly be? Master, we love to be with you. We love to hear your teaching day by day. But Jesus saw the greater picture. He said that he would come to them. Now he came in a way that is very different to what was expected. He came as the Spirit of God was that poor. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Corinthians tells us that if we have not received the Spirit of Christ, then we don't belong to him. So there is this over, overplay, different words used, Holy Spirit, Son of God, and uh, 
Spirit of Christ. So there's no there's a, a need for us to welcome that person, consciously welcome, and not be kind of a little apprehensive of this third person. We're, we concentrate on the Father, yes, we worship the Father, we love Jesus. And the whole person of the Holy Spirit was a shock to the disciples. Way back at the beginning of, of uh, John's ministry, the day he sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with the fire. The fire. Now, again, that would have been, what, that's a mystery. That is a mystery. But we find it in the, in the next chapter. In, in this unfolding story which I'm attempting to present. Jesus, we are told, spent 40 days after he after the resurrection meeting his disciples. He met the small group, he met the ladies at the tomb, Mary, and he met the wider group. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he met up to 500 people at one time. So hundreds of people over these 40 days saw the physical raised Jesus Christ. So their faith was real. It wasn't in a myth, it wasn't in a fable that they had heard of the Son of God, he was raised. They actually saw the one who had been raised. And that's what happened. Probably about an hour later after Pentecost, some years after, whenever it was, they all who were up in the upper room who experienced the coming of the Spirit of God, they ran out onto the streets and were Praising the Lord and giving thanks to, to Jesus. And the crowds were, what's happening to these people? What's, what's happened to them? They're transformed. And then Peter began to preach. And if you see the pictures of the Jerusalem, the temple on the steps on the southern slope, that's where he preached. He preached to thousands. And uh, that's been his archaeologically um, revealed as a place where they would gather. And also, there's hundreds of these uh, mikvehs, baths, for ritual bathing that it said, and they were baptized on that day. So it's like they came to faith, 3,000 came to faith on that day, and they were immediately baptized in these pools that had been used for ritual cleaning, which in a way is fine, but now they've come to a deeper cleaning to the forgiveness of Christ. So they immediately became witnesses of the, sa the saving power of God. They became evangelists, they became emissaries, ambassadors, full of the love of God to tell the world. And that's, the, that's our purpose. To tell one another, but also to tell the world that God loves them, that He sent His Son, to draw them to a faith in Christ. And it's our purpose, it doesn't change. Our purpose is not to fill the seats or not to, it's to, to preach the gospel, to bring sinners to repentance, to establish them in the faith, and for you to, to teach them or to to be their, their guides to a Christian life. That's the purpose, plain and simple. And if we were to ask ourselves here, how do we fail? How do we fail in that? Probably not very well. Probably not very well at all. To be faithful witnesses in the community. But God, I pray, will lead us to be that in the days to come. Really. So very, very simply today, and very really, really rather briefly, we're waiting for the Lord in these days as Pentecost begins tonight. Just think, just think about for a moment as we get on with our Sunday evening activities that in God's calendar, so to speak, in a wider church, the church across the world, there is beginning something that's important to God. And it causes us to think spiritually and maybe to pray a little. Spend a few minutes in prayer about this and say, Lord, what would you have us to wait for? And what do you want to do in our days in our church and Carnival Church? What is your purpose? Why would you send the Spirit to Carnival to this congregation? To begin just to enter into what I believe is a collective prayer. You don't all have to come to the prayer meeting. No. But if you take in a sense that prayer to your heart, pray it at home. Pray with 
expectation that the disciples had that God will move by his power and by his presence in these things. And every move of God in history, the hallmark of it, in every good thing, in every human being, has been the nearness of God's presence. Because Jesus promised that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to be with us. So it is really one of the most important experiences of any congregation that when we know the day of God's visitation has come. And uh, we pray, and uh, if I conclude with a verse from a well known hymn, the God of burning, cleansing flame. Look down and see this waiting host and send the promised Holy Ghost. We need another Pentecost. Send the fire today. Now, who was in here earlier on with Carl and trying to set up different microphones. And so he put on some music and it so happened. And I was really pleased that he did. He put on this very hymn. And I think these are not just coincidences, these are confirmations that the message today, church, here is that God would desire to send the blessed Holy Spirit upon us, although we're born again, but to do something new and to bless us with the Holy Spirit and with this fire. So let's pray and then we'll conclude with the final, with the final sin. Lord our God, help us to wait, not in vain in these days, but with expectation that comes from Biblical knowledge and our nearness to God. We want to make the promises that Jesus made to his disciples in that day a very real and personal one. And we pray, Lord, for this church here. It won't be based on our merits and our goodness and our great spirituality or any of our gifts, but according to our desire for you to visit us. And as we welcome visitors this day, Lord, and will continue to do so, we pray that the one whom Jesus sent on that day would be most welcome to visit here every meeting, every day we gather, and that he will transform our lives and make something beautiful to you. Hear this and answer us, and meet with us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Timing is everything. I think the children will have hardly had time to sort of settle in, maybe between a short meeting and a long preamble. But we'll get these things right and I hope they'll be satisfied. And just one thing I'll put to both the children. I put uh, a post on the church page yesterday, which was an invitation to the community. Uh, saying that you know, we'd love to have your children and even if you want to just drop them off at church and come back to them we have teachers who love to spend time with them and to give them quality time and so I put that on our page but I've also put it on the, uh, the community newsletter we managed to squeeze it in with another item so we're putting out the message to, to the community your children are very welcome, we'd love to teach them we'd love to add them to the role that love parents to come. So we have a sense of purpose and uh, I trust them to bear fruit. Even if it's one or two, that would be great. But really stretch the teachers in the days to come. And really give them a DJ Gray hair. Um, so let's continue. I should stop jesting in these ways. Uh, we're going to sing paraphrase 54 to conclude. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause, and take the glory of his cross and honour all his sons. <laughs>
May we walk in the knowledge of the Christ in our hearts and our lives, our shepherd and our guide. May his peace guard your heart, your soul, and may you go in well-being and in health. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you, today and evermore. Amen.